Okay, so we'll uh, continue here. This, uh, this link here, CSS position values, I was just looking at that. This is quite a big site here, CSS Tricks. I, I've never really used this site before, but I, I started noticing it um, you know, just before starting this class. It seems to have a lot of uh, good material in it, so I'm, I'm using it a lot more now. And uh, this is a, there's a video here, which I didn't listen to. I listened to maybe two or three minutes of it. And uh, it's, it sounds uh, excellent. I mean, and this is a, this is a really confusing topic. A CSS position, position values, or positioning, element positioning. So what, one thing we could today, we could listen to the whole thing together. It's, uh, what is it, 15 minutes or so, 13 minutes. Uh, we could do that and do experiments together. Or uh, perhaps you could just do that on your own. I haven't decided yet, but we could decide together. Um, so that's one thing. And there's a link to it right here. So that's a... CSS positioning, that's just a, it's one of those things you need to understand and uh, it's an important uh, part of CSS. So it's worth mastering that. And once again, it's very confusing and I think they have a lot of features in there that you can ignore. Uh, rather than exhaustively going through and trying to understand every little feature and all the exceptions, I believe what this video does is it kind of cuts to the chase and tells you this is important, one, two, three, that's it. And uh, anyway, that's how he starts the video and uh, it's, it's convincing from the beginning. So that's, uh, I think that's worth looking at. Now I talked about this can I use last time. Uh, I added this new link here, game programming. And there's a uh, there's at least two people, probably several others, that uh, are interested in uh, game programming. You know, they're, they're, they're the game development majors. And, uh, and this, this uh, the course, working with JavaScript and the Canvas element, right here is a link to this Canvas element. Now this is a, uh, this would be a good exercise, even if you don't ultimately build a game that runs in a web browser, it's useful to go through the exercise of doing so in this class because it uh, follows the same patterns that you would uh, see in all the other game development contexts. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a simulation loop, it runs, you know, at your frame rate, normally 30, 60 times a second. And uh, you just get to see how, uh, how mainly this game loop. You want to see what goes on in the game loop, how to, how to do that. And um, so this is something that I've tinkered with quite a bit over the years. And uh, so I'll be spending time on that in this class. Maybe not today, but uh, in, uh, in the coming weeks, I'll, I'll spend time on this. But if you want to... And I just organize these links. It's, you know, it's been a while since I worked on this. So I need to refresh my memory and practice with it a little bit. And uh, I just went through my old material and I pulled out a bunch of things that, uh, uh, that I wanted to use to sort of go through and refresh my memory and use as a starting point to talk about this, this topic. It's also, this is a good exercise to uh, master, to help you master JavaScript as well. To do a lot of JavaScript programming and to try to implement a game uh, using this uh, Canvas element, or any game actually, you don't have to use Canvas element. Uh, so, I'll show you one of these in particular. It's a responsive Canvas. This is something I did some time ago, and uh, it's an example of a canvas-based web page that adjusts to different screen sizes. I've got this in a, uh, a Git repository on GitHub. 
Now, I'm just going to show you how you might uh, retrieve this, uh, this source code. So I'm just going to go through that process. I'm going to copy this uh, URL and uh, clone this thing. So I'm going to create a, uh, let's see, I will do a I'll just check it out here. I'm already in a Git repository, so I I want to be careful when I'm checking out a, uh, a Git repository inside of another Git repository. I, I don't want that uh, sort of to mess things up. So I'll show you how I manage that. So let's go ahead and get it. So Git clone. Here's the URL. It's going to create a folder called Responsive Canvas. And uh, let's take a look at that. There it is. The source code is in there. But I, if you look, it's, uh, I don't know what git status is going to do here. It's going to say, yeah, it's going to say, oh, you could add this. But I don't want to add that. So I'm going to um, edit this, uh, this file .git ignore. Yeah, these are patterns that uh, you put things in here, you're telling Git that you want to ignore this. So there's a folder I want to ignore. So if I do Git status now, it doesn't appear in there anymore. So test, what do I have in test? Yeah. So let's go into that folder. And uh, you'll see it's got uh, this index.html file. So there it is. This is an example, illustrates how to ad adapt a gameplay area to different screens. The green rectangle is the background image. So here it's got a background image. And the red rectangle is the gameplay area. And uh, the system always keeps the gameplay area visible. It tries to render as much of the green area as possible without further reducing the scale. So it, and also it maintains the uh, aspect ratio. I should have, probably should have put that in there. Click on the screen to move the pepper. It will not leave the gameplay area. So if I click over here, the pepper is going to move to where I click to. But if I, if I click outside the gameplay area, the red area, It'll stop at that border. And when you resize this, right, so if I make this thing smaller, it's, uh, it's going to shrink everything to keep the aspect ratio the same. And it makes the, uh, the green area as large as possible. You know, in, in video games, this green area, also in, I mean in, in, in video in general, this is called letterboxing. So you've got some content like a video or a, or a video game and you want to render it on an arbitrary screen. And different screens have different um, aspect ratios. So you, you, don't, if you, you don't want to stretch your uh, display area to fill in the, the devices uh, of screen because then you're going to get distortions. You're going to get stretching. So you want to keep the aspect ratio the same. And you want your letterboxing area here, This, if it's an image, that you want that, 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 that background image to be as large as possible to cover as much space as you can make it. So that's, that's, that's how this thing works. So just, to, just use it as a reference. <coughs> Now look, I'm retrieving this from the file system. Now maybe you have a, a Git repository. I've asked several of you to s create Git repositories uh, so that I can more easily look at your code. And I can check it out if I want to as well. And there's another benefit of creating a Git repository and using that in this class. And that is you can, you could so configure your your remote repository to be available as a uh, as a website. I'm going to show you how to do that. So 
here we have, I just see our guys, let's see, here we go, honey. Here is a, um, my, this is my uh, repository. And if you go into settings, down here, uh, GitHub pages. And in this section, you can set this thing to one of these two things here, master branch or master branch doc. So I'm going to set this to uh, master branch. So I'm going to make the master branch, turn the master branch into a uh, public website. So whatever's in the master branch is now retrievable uh, through this URL right here. There it is. So now we are, you know, public. So now this is one way to uh, publish a website. That's how I do my home page, for instance. I would say I have my. It's not much of a home page. I sit right there. But uh, that's the URL. That's the public URL, and this is just a uh, a repository that I maintain. Uh, that's how I just. That's how I e quickly put up a website. Just something that. To make public that I can share with other people. So you can make use of that as well, and uh, as you're going through this class. All right. Let's see what else I want to talk about. And there's this link to uh, some CSS notes. <coughs> Spend some time with this. Uh, so there's two things I wanted to talk about. This um, how to make a um, your website so sent uh, what do they call it adaptable to uh, different screen sizes. It's called a responsive uh, design. And you do you use this uh, this media element or media commands here to do this. So let's go ahead, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this. So the, 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 the problem is how do you change the CSS rules based on screen width? All right, so a phone has a small screen width, you know, rather than displaying, say, your menu in a horizontal manner, you want to make it a vertical list rather than a horizontal list. Uh, so you would need some mechanism. You use this media uh, command here and uh, make and so to create sort of a, a condition. So that so if you can look at this code here, it's saying that the body has a background that's uh, that's green in color. But if the device has a maximum screen width of 600 pixels, then let's overwrite that that rule, that formatting rule, make the background color red. Let's take a look at how that works. Yeah, I don't need this, so I'm going to just take it out. There we go. So here we have a green background. So here are the uh, the width of the screen or this display area is greater than 600 pixels. So when I get under 600 pixels, then it'll turn red. I mean, you wouldn't do this. I mean, this, this is, you know, this is, this is just an example I got from uh, W3Schools, by the way. And uh, what was I going to talk about here? I forgot. Oh, yeah. Testing it, it's interesting to test this on your phone. Now, how would you test this on the phone? Well, you could publish it on GitHub as a web page, 
and use your phone and go to that go to the website so you can do it like that but when you and to make your changes public on this github website you have to push you have to write you have to synchronize your local repository with the remote repository and when you do that the there's a delay uh, it's a delay of a couple of minutes uh, so that uh, your changes aren't uh, aren't visible until after I don't know two three minutes maybe five minutes sometimes so it's inconvenient when you're doing development to rely on GitHub Git pages and GitHub to to do these experiments so to uh, to do the tests more quickly you want to it's better to uh, run a local web server. So we do that using, uh, you know, Node here. There it is. Now we're retrieving the file through the through the um, web server running locally. Then you would take your phone. So let me go ahead and try it. How would I test? I did this at home, by the way. And you'll be able to do it at home as well, but I don't think you can do it here on campus. So I'm going to do this experiment for the first time and, uh, and verify that this is not the campus wireless network will not allow my phone to connect to my laptop through port 9999. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that is going to be denied. Now at home, you know, you're running on your your router, right? Your wireless router probably have, you know, whatever, cable, internet, whatever. You've got a wireless router that serves all the devices in your house. And uh, that that will not block that by default, your wireless router in your home probably doesn't interfere with TCP connections between devices within your private network. Uh, which is uh, and I so so this experiment would work at home, but I don't think it'll work here. So I would open up my browser on my phone and uh, go to my my web server on my laptop. Well, how do I get to my laptop? It's not like if I type in localhost, it means you know localhost on my phone means my phone. And uh, so that's not going to work. So I need to know the IP address of my uh, of uh, my web server, or I'm sorry, of my of my laptop. Now you know you can do things like what's my IP address? What's my IP address? Right? I don't know, so anyone ever do this? This is oh, there's your IP address, right? Does anyone see the problem with this? This is this number here is you know this this is what it looks like. This is the IP address it looks like I'm at on the outside of the university network. But the university network is a private network. I think it's a private network. Is it a private network? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a private network. Uh, so this this IP address packets going to this IP address are going to get rewritten on the way to my laptop. So this is uh, this won't work. It's the same thing in your home. You can't use this on your home if you want to connect your phone to your laptop. You can't use this approach to find the IP address of your laptop because that that's what the outside world would look at, would see. But you need to know your your private local. IP address of your laptop because your phone is on that same private network in your home. How do you get the IP address? Well, I mean, there's a number of different ways, but uh, one way is uh, to use, let's see, I think it's if config, and this gives uh, the information. Uh, in a, in a Unix-style uh, uh, operating system like uh, OS 10 or Linux, but uh, Windows, you'd have to use a different uh, command. I, I forget what Windows uses. Anybody know what Windows uses for this? 
I peak, okay, that's, I remember that's right, I peak, okay, it's just one letter different. Now, this is, this thing is scrolling off the window, so I need to, uh, I'm going to run it, I'm going to pipe the output through another program, this is a pipe, care, a pipe operation. It, it, the standard output stream coming out of ifconfig, it's scrolling off my, out of my view area here, so I'm going to, pipe the, the output through another program called less. It's a utility. It's part of the Unix uh, collection of utilities. And now I could go through it like this. And it gives the, this is the symbol that represents the a network interface. So this is the loopback interface. And you'll see there's, this is the IP address of the loopback interface. That's local host. When I type in local host, it's the same as this IP address. Or there's a whole group of them. Anything that starts, I believe it's anything that starts at 127. Let me try that. So let's see, localhost here. So instead of using the, the domain name localhost, I will use the IP address of this loopback interface, you know, the IP address of the localhost. They mean the same thing. There it is. There's the website. Now, there's a lot of these. I, I think I could use, uh, for instance, uh, you know, 98. Anything that it'll go to the same place. I think everything that's, I believe everything that starts at 127 will work. Let me test that. Yeah, anything that starts with 127 as the first byte in the IP address would go to the local host. But when you see it in documentation, you usually see it like this, uh, 127.0.0.1. And these are other uh, network interfaces for, I, and I don't know what these do, but this is the one we want. That's the network interface that's used to communicate um, over the wireless network. And it has the, uh, it has the, IP address right there. You'll see it's got four numbers, 10.123.119.19. This is, this is uh, version eight, internet protocol version eight. This is a different, uh, a longer IP address. And uh, we don't want to use that, we're not gonna use that. So I'm gonna copy this. Actually, I don't need to copy it. At home, if you're at home, you would then use that Use that number, and you could try this on your phone. See if you can go to this. See if you can get to, to my web server and see it fail. But at home, it will work. So I'm going to type this in, HTTP colon. I could see it's defaulting to the IP address of my home network when I ran this uh, experiment, slash, slash, 10. You'll see any address that starts with 10 is a private IP address. So the university, you know, when you connect to the wireless network on the university, you're assigned an IP address as part of a private network. And when you go outside of the wireless network, your packets, your data packets, that IP address is going to be rewritten to a different IP address. So this, this IP address is different than... Uh, and that one, this is a public IP address, 139. That's a public address. All right, so uh, let's see. It's 10 dot, is it 123 dot, so I'm predicting that this fails. If it doesn't fail, that's great, because then we can do more tests. 19 colon, with a port number, 9999. Nine, nine, nine. And then I'll add a slash in there, too. And then go. It's not the block. Once again, that's, that's the university for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But at home, you can do this experiment. All right.
right, so what was I going to do next? Oh, yeah, this. That's the responsive. Uh, and we don't need to be running the web server. We're going to kill that. So look at how this works. You know, it could be something else. Like, suppose we had something in the body here. Like, uh, if we had a, an H1 uh, element. And uh, let's just see how this works by playing with it a bit, okay? So instead of background color set to green, let's let let's make the the, the text. So if you just just color by itself, it's called the foreground color, and it applies to the color of the text. Let's make the text green. So the, the color of the H1 element will make it green. Now, if the screen has a maximum width that's less than, say, I'm going to set that at uh, 500 just to make it a little easier. If the screen width is uh, 500 or less, then we're going to change this, change this rule uh, to uh, make the color, say, red. You see, this is redundant, right? Like if you if you have H1 and I call it green here, and then I then in the very next line, uh, you know, I reassign the value blue to color, then H1 will be blue. So it's a it's the last uh, rule that dominates. So it's a sequential thing. So this is, you know, when the browser loads this uh, this web page, it's going to say, okay, the H1 color is green. And then when it gets to here, it gets triggered sometimes. And when it's triggered, it'll replace that color with red. And if, and if this condition is not triggered, then it will not do this. So it will remain green. So it's like a, see, if you're looking at this, if you look at the logical structure of this, this is an if condition. So this is, you know, this is the statement that says assign H1 to color green. And then if, you know, it's raining outside, then change the color to red. But it's an if condition. It's based on something. So it's, that's all it is. Let's take a look at that. So I'm going to reload that. So when I make this screen narrow, it's going to turn to red. There you go. On a phone, you can't resize your browser, so it's just going to pop up red. So you can't do that. But on a on a on a laptop, you you know, or desktop, you can change the, the size of your uh, your screen. What what's considered the screen? So there it is. So this media, what do they call it? Media media query. That's what they use. That's the terminology they use. The media query. And they have other, uh, so th this is a media query that's related to the screen. They have media queries that's related to other things like, um, say, print. So I think it's print. I better check that, though. Let me see, media query. So here's the media types. So screen, used for computer screens, tablets, etc. Then there's print. So if you're if you ask the browser to print this web page, then it's going to use this rule uh, to do the styling when it prints. So you may be viewing 
the document. It's got a green header. And the, but when you print the document, the header appears red uh, because of this, uh, this media query that's, uh, that's uh, using a media type of print. And of course, all means everything. And then you've got this fourth one here, speech. So that's for um, you know people that are, are visually impaired, and they they have uh, they have a tool that converts the web page into um, into voice. And then you're gonna you can use it for that purpose. So that's the. You know, that's the most important uh, technique or feature that you use of CSS <laughs> to make a website uh, responsive to the, um, you know, to cell phones versus tablets or, or desktops. This media query. Oh, one more thing. You got to have this line in there. It doesn't work without that line. And I tried it. So you can try this at home, say, using your phone. And see that that line is absolutely needed. And uh, I always just believed that it was needed, you know, before. And uh, I don't like to just believe things. So I always just like to run an experiment to see it actually work, and then I then I really believe it. Now we might be this might uh, not be required in the. Um, In a browser, let's test it in a browser. So I want to, I want to redo this. Oh no, we'll just do it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out of that. There we are. We back out of everything. Go back to the original. And let's take this out. I gotta save it. And now I'm going to reload. There it is. I'm gonna reload this. It's the background color is going to be green, and I shrink it to less than 600 pixels. It'll become red, but I, let's see if it fails after taking that line out. It's green. Now before, when we shrunk it, it turned around. It still works, but it won't work on the phone. That's the thing. You need it on the phone. So did I really re I did reload that. And, uh, you know, so you can't test it on the browser. But you, like I said, you can test it on your phone, but we can't do that here because of the university security policy. And what this does is it says, I'll see what I'm gonna say. It's hard to remember. It's like, rather than just trying to come to a statement, I'm gonna just follow that link. What is the viewport, right? So this thing is the viewport. What is the viewport? So they have a nice uh, explanation here. It's the user's visible area of a web page. That's called the viewport. It varies with the device. The viewport is smaller on a mobile phone. Yep, before tablets and mobile phones, Web pages were designed only for computer screens. So as a result, originally, these web pages had a static design. They had a fixed size, static design. But now, because of the, obviously, all these different devices are connected. So you've got to, uh, the web, web page uh, design has got to be more, it's more complicated. HTML5, that's a name of a recent uh, incarnation of HTML. They introduced the, they, they allow designers, they allow web designers to take control over the viewport with this meta tag. And here's the line. It's the same line. It's basically, that's it. You're, you're not going to do anything different than this. Uh, but just for completeness, let's read this. So this attribute assignment right there, width equals device width, that's uh, right here. 
you set content to that to these values. So this, apparently this tells the page to follow, tells the browser to follow the screen width of the device. And this value here sets the initial zoom level when the page is first loaded by the browser. Because when phones first came out, smartphones first came out and they were used to access websites uh, they to make the websites easier to uh, to understand or read. The uh, the phone uh, pretended like the screen was bigger than it really was. Uh, so in other words, it was sca it was scaling. And this is saying, don't do that. Just keep don't don't give me the don't don't scale. Don't give me an artificial width. Don't tell me you've got you know thousand pixels of width when you only have 500. And so this is this is what you're telling the browser. You're telling the phone's browser uh, not to scale, to leave the scale at one. So the scale is a multiplier. So you multiply by one, it doesn't change anything. All right, I think that's, uh, that's enough on that. Although we could do an experiment, but this doesn't seem to be affecting the browser, but what if I did this? Nah, it's going to waste I could try. I mean, it would be fun to play with different values, right, and see what would happen there. But I'm not going to do that. Because I'm not sure the browser is going to do anything. But the phone would, I believe the phone would, would uh, give us some something to look at. All right. Uh, what the heck? Calendar, I don't need that. Um, what else is I going to do? I'll just normalize there. I wanted to talk about this. Oh yeah, this. This is really common. I uh, this has been such a hassle uh, for me, you know, in the past to get this thing to work right. How do you center something in a web page? And here's uh, I'll just talk about that really quickly. Now I should have the body tag here. You know. It, when you when you see uh, you look at uh, you know web pages, let me show you an example there. So to view the source on this web page. See the indentation? So the indentation helps to, all this indentation, it shows the structure. Basically, indentation is used to, uh, to show the parent-child relationship between elements. But in a web page, there's so many parent-child <laughs> relationships that, that it just goes so deep, right? The indentation kind of gets meaningless at a certain point. You just sort of get lost here. I mean, that's a lot of indentation. Uh, so I like to try to not to get carried away with the indentation. So I, I just sometimes I just bring things to the left edge here uh, and uh, just sort of ignore that a bit. And I use two spaces. You see that a lot in uh, JavaScript. You see two spaces for indentation because JavaScript, you have a lot of indentation going on. But if you're working a language like C, C++, C sharp, maybe you use a tab or you use four spaces uh, to use more indentation because you tend to have less parent-child relationships between your statements. So let's, uh, this is centering. So this is a, um, 
let's see what that looks like. Here's a here's a div right, with a some old thing that gets stuck in my memory because it popped out when I was writing the example. Let's take a look at that. So this is this is a div, and I gave it a width. You see, you know, it if I didn't give it the div a width, the, the line would stretch out all the way across. But I gave the uh, I gave the div a uh, style with the width. I set the width to 250 pixels to constrain it. And uh, this isn't needed for that. So that would be no, it's the same. They're going to get the same result there, right? So a div is a block element. Now let's suppose we want to center this into the page. How do we do that? Well, there's a number of different ways of doing it. But in my opinion, although I like I'm not an expert at CSS and I don't use it that much, but I can this this is a, an approach that I can remember and I think it's simple enough. Uh, so you you put this div, you make it a div inside of another div, and in this outer div you give it a uh, a style of text align center. That means center the text. But normally it would be you know center the text. So it would look something like this. That's what centered text looks like. But apparently, you can uh, you can center other things, like you can center a div. This text align center affects a uh, a div that's inside of it, and this will center the div inside of it. And I'm going to sh let's take a look at what it looks like without this display inline block. So it's just a regular block, a block within a block. So a div is the display uh, attribute. The default display attribute of a div is block. Let me save that. It's no good. I'm going to change its dis its uh, its display attribute to uh, or display property to inline block. So block means, you know, it sits on it. it it's its own. They talked about that a little bit there. Block means if when the element has a display value of block, takes control of the whole row, the whole strength, uh, the horizontal extent across the screen. It just takes that over. When you say inline block, well, then the, the element retains some properties of being a block, but not all. And the one prop, the important property that it doesn't retain is that behavior of stretching out and taking control of the whole horizontal space along the screen. And I'll, let me show that to you. I think there's a way I can do that. If we uh, set the color back, we'll set the co background color. Background color. We'll set the background color to uh, to green. There you go. See, it's an inline block. And if I, I put this text here, I got another div. I say I put, I'll just put text in there. See, it, inline means it a line. Inline it, it means it's like text. It it stretches from the left. Well, you know, if it's left justified. It stretches from the left to the right. When it hits the edge, it'll wrap around and start on the left side again and continue. So it's going to lay out its elements sequentially from left to right until it gets to the end. It can't display it anymore. It's going to, like a typewriter, it'll go down to the next line 
and you know carriage return line too. But uh, but if we make this say um, if we let the div be its original default um, you know block not the block characteristic then it's not it's no longer going to be uh, displayed as an inline element. It's going to sort of try to take command of the whole horizontal uh, display area. So watch. Oh, that didn't show up actually. Well, that's because of the width here. How about I change this? I got to get rid of that width. And uh, I want to get rid of some of these lines here. See how that stretches out? Even though the text itself, you know, doesn't doesn't stretch out across the whole screen, the div itself is occupying this whole space. That's a that's a block. We're going to make this an inline block. It means retain some of the block characteristics of it, but there it is. See. And of course, this will this will be the same. We we'll just make it in line, and it'll it'll give us the same result because this is not uh, it's not very long. See, that's the same result. But if we made this long, uh, then uh, you'll see it won't work. Oops. So there now it's it's in line. It's going to be scrolling. See how that scrolls. And that's scrolling, it's a wrapping. And we make this an inline block. Ah, here we go. What the heck? Got to be more careful up here. Inline block here. Oh, oh, before we hit refresh, what the heck is this going to do? If I go inline block. Then uh, what's going to happen when I hit refresh on that? Any CSS experts out there know what's going to happen? I mean, this is how you test your, your knowledge, right? I, I have a hypothesis. You know, I'm, I'm right about 85% of the time when I do this. I, I can I, I, I can describe what I think is going to happen here. Is there anyone here who can describe what they think is going to happen here? See that you, you don't have to tell me, but I'm just showing you that if you just start changing things and hitting refresh and change refresh change refresh, you're not learning anything, right? You need to formulate a hypothesis. It's like oh now I have understanding, so in my next experiment I'm going to do the prediction based on my understanding. That prediction is my hypothesis. And then I hit reload, and then I see if I'm right or wrong. You see, that, that's, that's, how you, that's how you build your confidence in your knowledge. If you just start changing things and hitting refresh, you're not, there's no digestion going on. You see, you see the problem there? Okay, so let's see. I, what I think is going to happen is this hello will be a line on its own. And that the stuff that's highlighted in green will go down to the next line. Now, my ego's on the line here because I could get this wrong, right? And I go, oh, I guess I didn't understand it. You know, I'm the professor. And like I said, 85% of the time I get this right. So I got it. Got it. Yes, I'm in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 uh. All right, those two two small things I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, CSS. You one issue with CSS is that uh, different uh, browsers uh, have different behaviors. 
And uh, so you might do something, you're developing on Safari or Chrome or Firefox, whatever. And uh, you got your site done, and then you someone looks at it in a different browser and it's broken, or, or it's off a little bit. And you go, well, what's going on there? So there's this, uh, this, 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 uh, this CSS file called normalize.css. It's just a little file with a bunch of rules in there. And this thing keeps changing over time, but it just uh, it attempts to uh, normalize it. It, it sets some uh, some CSS rules that uh, that that uh, compensate for some of the bugs that uh, or differences between uh, the browsers. So it makes them uh, consistent. So let's see. We could use uh, we can download that thing. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Download. Well, that's not really downloading, is it? But that's what the document looks like. There it is. So this is uh, it's it's widely used, and uh, so you just just to be aware of it. Let's give an example here. Well, remove the margin in all browsers. Yeah. So render the main element consistently in IE. Yeah. So what? So just, there's an explanation of uh, what needs to get done, and then followed by the CSS. So, so the, there's an element named main, and it should be a block element. But all the browsers have this uh, main element to, uh, by default, a block element, except Internet Explorer. So we throw this rule in there so that if someone goes to the website using Internet Explorer, that main element gets uh, treated like a block element. And it goes down through this. It's, uh, and if there is, you see, it's nicely annotated here. You know, grouping content. Number one, add the correct box sizing in Firefox. And then they show this is this is the you know one thing that they're doing. It's number one. So this is this is where that's accomplished. These two lines. So these two lines are needed in order for Firefox to have the same behavior as all the other browsers. It's only needed for Firefox. Now in Edge and Internet Explorer, there's a problem with overflow. Uh, so this this line here, and this all has to do with this uh, horizontal rule, HR's horizontal rule. It's just a, a line, horizontal line. And uh, so this this rule here is needed in order for Edge and Internet Explorer to render horizontal rules in the same way as they render them, uh, as it's rendered in the other browsers. That's a nice uh, nice resource to have, and I just thought I'd let you see that. I should probably put a link to that. Now yeah, you can find that. It's in the video. All right, it's almost five o'clock. Any questions? Anybody have a question? I'm going to wrap up early then. And let's see, this game program, this is what I kind of want to do. You know, I'm a programmer, I like programming. You know, CSS. Every time I used to work with CSS, I'd end up spending hours and days, and I felt my life was disappearing on me, and I it was like a black hole. And I, I have to say that my recent experience has been a lot better. I think maybe because of uh, uh, some of the new features that make it a lot better. Maybe I'm just you know spending more time with it. I don't know. But I like to do programming, and uh, so these projects here that I uh, that I put together that to illustrate uh, you know, game development I'm, I'm kind of interested in. So I'll end up spending more time on this as, as we go on in the class. And let's see, course web search source code. Uh, so yeah, this one here. I'll show you what that looks like. It illustrates some things about JavaScript and inheritance and so on. I think I won't get into that, but you can, if you want to, uh, I'll talk about this more perhaps uh, maybe next week or even even later. I, I just remembered now what I wanted to talk about. 
this uh, W3 schools. And it was the, uh, let me use references here, CSS reference. This is pretty good. It's, W3 Schools has really improved a lot, and uh, I never used to use it very much, but now I'm using it a lot. I've got, I should probably talk about this CSS selectors. And uh, let's see, don't know if I need it. It's probably, a, I think I'll skip that. CSS um, functions, CSS uh, variables. Where is that? CSS variables. They don't have that. Functions. Oh, yeah, this uh, bar here. This is really handy. I'll just explain this to you. And I will quit. All right, we've got, um, maybe we have, um, we have a heading. We're just spacing out here. That uh, by hello and by let's change the color the text color of this h1 to uh, to red or to uh, say um, Something like this, like uh, A zero forty-five and um, we'll do the same thing with the uh, the paragraph or the div rather. And let's let's do this. Let's um, normally it would look something like this. Just to introduce a new idea here. And this could be uh, the class is um, special. So divs that are special, so here I'm using uh, Let's call it a class, uh, a class selector. So we want to say we want the same color for the heading on the, and the special. That's the same color. And you've got, you know, normally got a big web page, got so many lines in it, and it's complicated. So you want some things to be the same color. And some things you don't want. So one way you can do this, maybe there's something more about being special here. Maybe there's a, uh, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, um, is it margin left, uh, you know, uh, 40 pixels. There's two things about being special. And now, you may have other things that you want to assign the same color to. And so maybe you've got like the color you've assigned it, 
you know, to 10 different, same color appears at 10 different places throughout maybe multiple style sheets. And, uh, and then you want to change the color. The artist says, no, the web designer says, no, we got to have a little different color. So we've got to change the color. So you got to go through your document or multiple documents, change that same color over and over again. Uh, one way to to deal with that is you could make a class, call it uh, you know color value one, you know, something like that, and this is your color value one. Maybe this H one is a text aligned. Center, so I'm going to put it in the center. And uh, there we go. Now we want these two things to be the same color. But we don't want to, and maybe there's a, a hundred of these CSS rules that use that color. So we're just going to make a, a class and call it color one here. And now Whatever we want to have that color, we just assign that class. So I'm going to call that uh, color one. And oh, open oh, this div. We want to give that the same color, but we already have a class there, right? So what do we do? Well, we can assign two classes. So it's a special. This, the special class is associated with this div, but also. The, uh, this this color one class. So that's how you can you can give you can specify two different classes uh, for a particular element. And there we go. Now it's there. That's one way to do it. But it makes it a little messy because now you've got to use these things, right? But it's another way to do it without having to create a separate class just for that particular color. There's another way to do it. And that is to uh, – I just learned how to do this, by the way. I think there's something called a root element. Let me see there. But we'll see what that looks like. Not, not that one. Uh, yeah, colon root. Yeah, that's it. So I got that screwed up. And I don't, I don't know what this means. It's like global. So make this a, this is a global um, thing. So we're gonna, we're gonna call this, uh, call this the C1 color. The C1 color is, uh, is that value right there. Is that what it looks like? No, it's a colon. There we go. So this C1 is a variable. So we go dash, dash, variable name, colon, and then its value. And then inside these, these uh, rules, we can, uh, we can do something like this. We go color, and we use the var function. A dereference that uh, that C1 variable in both. So we keep everything inside the CSS. We don't we don't complicate, you know, the HTMLs with additional classes. There it is. Now it's working. Now, if the if you want to change the design, and you only change your color in one place, and it propagates throughout all your CSS, that's really handy. Now, can you really use this? Yeah. <laughs> My ears are getting really bad. Real-time JavaScript? Yeah, you can use JavaScript too. Yeah. I mean, there's a number of different ways of doing this. You could do it with JavaScript so that 
when the web page uh, loads, you know, JavaScript could run and just go ahead and do, do a bunch of replacements. Just do, a, uh, I, I can show you how to do that, actually, if you'd like. I, that's a good exercise. I, let's do it. But let me hold on that for a second. I'm going to talk about something else first. That's a good idea. Um, the thing is, it's a new feature. So, you know, can I use, can I use var? It's a variable font. Oh, no, it's called, uh, it's called CSS uh, custom properties. Is this custom properties? I think that's what it is. There it is. CSS variables. And, oh, Internet Explorer doesn't support it. Version 6 through 10 and, and, and 11 as well. That's 1.7% of the global population. That's 0.3%. That's, that's 2% of the global browser use. And Opera Mini doesn't support it either. That's another 1.5%. So there, we're losing 3.5% uh, of, you know, if you were serving these pages, you know, globally, I guess, and you're going to be, Missing three and a half percent. So three and a half percent of the um, of the page views will be faulty. So you got to decide. Well, do you really want to use this or not? And uh, so that's that's something I'd think about. Now, what people do is they're using uh, things like these CSS processors, like SAS. There, SAS basics and uh, pre-processing. So basically, you have expressions like this. You have variables like this, and if, before you publish your uh, your content to the web, you run it through the SAS preprocessor, and it replaces all the uh, Color values it replaces these these variables with uh, you know dereferences all the variables for you rather than relying on the browser to do it using the advanced features that are coming out. And so this is really big, and there's another one called less as well, uh, but it seems to be less popular. Maybe that's unfortunate. They use the word less there. I used to use less because it's based on Node and uh, it's based on, less is written in JavaScript, so it was easier for me to tinker with it. A SAS is uh, written in uh, Ruby. I think it's Ruby. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Ruby. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a Ruby programmer, but I, I, you know, I'm a JavaScript programmer. So I thought less, but for some reason, SAS got more popular. Although less is still around. It does essentially the same thing, and you can do it. So... These preprocessors uh, are used to uh, let you make use of what these advanced features uh, are providing, but they don't use the same syntax. They don't provide the same syntax. Although I haven't checked, uh, I haven't checked these things recently. Maybe, maybe SAS will <laughs> rewrite, you know, these these variables for you uh, because it has its own syntax for setting variables. So anyway, the pre-processing is done for other purposes as well. In addition to variable resolution, variable replacement, it's used for um, obfuscation. Like you don't want people to easily hack your JavaScript, for instance. And uh, so you want, you want to obfuscate your code so that people can't rip you off. And so you, 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 you replace all the nicely named variables and the indentation and everything. Remove all the indentation. Rename the variables to, you know, some generic things like A39. You know, it doesn't have any meaning. Then it becomes harder to, uh, for someone to steal your stuff. Even though it's because everything that's on the web is just there. And you just retrieve it. You can, you know, you can, you can plagiarize other people's works very easily on, on the web. And then there's other things. that You can also uh, uh, compress. So uh, before you publish your, your, uh, your content, you know, they may be fairly large files, and you want to save on bandwidth, so you want to also do 
uh, compression, right? So you might do some kind of compression. So we've got all these things, these cleaning. So you're you're working, you're doing your development, uh, you know, in a way that's easy for you to do that. And then before you publish everything, you run it through a, a preprocessor. And SAS is just a preprocessor for the CSS. There are other preprocessing tasks that you would do. This is this thing called Webpack. It does compression and so on, some other things. So uh, that's a big part of web development these days. So if you want to get sophisticated, you got to learn how to use these preprocessing tools. And uh, the question was about JavaScript. We could do this in JavaScript, and uh, that would be fun to do. And I maybe next time I can show how to do that. That's a good exercise, you know, try to accomplish this in JavaScript. And help you learn JavaScript, so it's a nice exercise. But we're out of time, and uh, so we'll just continue next week. Okay.